Our story today starts with Red the Lemur and his master, Scarlet. Why, why hasn't the symphony started yet? The orchestra is all here and Topaz is ready to conduct, isn't she? Why, yes, Red, I believe she is. Then why aren't we playing? Because we have a new conductor joining us today. Where? I don't see them. They're out there. Oh, you mean out there? There's some very interesting looking lemurs. Do you think they can play instruments too? I'm sure they'll do magnificently. Oh, I think they're about ready. Hello, everyone. Hello. So looks like we're about ready to start here. So if you haven't already, let's go ahead and join in at symphony.dev. You see, symphony with a Y was taken, but I kind of like this better. <laughs> I'm surprised I got that one, honestly. But I'm not going to complain. I like it. It's actually better. So we'll go ahead and get you all there. Give that a second. Oh, right. I should turn on the volume on here. Otherwise, that's not actually going to do anything, is it? OK, then. Let's go ahead and have our fun real quick. We'll go ahead and load this up. And then we're going to hope this works. <laughs> I have some reasonable amount of confidence because I've cheated. I'm not going to say how, but I have cheated. Oh, no, no, no. Come on. Conference Wi-Fi is fun. We will endeavor, though. So a little bit about what this talk is. While this is going on, I submitted this crazy idea to RailsConf because I had this dream of conducting a symphony orchestra. This isn't exactly what I had in mind, but it does work. So we're going to see if we can manage to make that happen. Now it looks like we're about halfway loaded. Come on. Which is why we have this today. I mean, worst case, I'm just going to switch over to localhost and make it run there. I don't want to, but. We will see. Come on. Hmm. You see, this is why you're very cautious about doing things through Wi-Fi, which is why we're going to switch over to localhost. Well, I have 109 of you there already. I'm not sure about the rest of them. Come on, you can do it. What's the latency at anyway? Ooh, wow, that's impressive. Someone's like two weeks behind. <laughs> How do you do that? It's probably Android, never mind. <laughs> I'm using Android, which probably explains a few other things. OK, so we're going to go ahead and cheat and go to the local version of this. Oh, yes. You can see exactly what's going on over there. You can also see it's stuck loading. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to demo this with smaller audiences later. But to give the experience anyways, we're going to go ahead and let's see here. Run this. Run this. Nope. Run this. Yeah, you see 129 are ready. I'm not sure about those last few. Oh, is that actually going to work? I saw a few more populate there. Oh, well. So we'll just go ahead and run this off of here. Because this does still work off of WebSockets, and it does technically count. OK, that buffer is in like five seconds.
does work locally. I promise that much. This is why we have contingency plans, ladies and gentlemen. Son of a. OK. Now, we're going to try this again. Oh, of course, because my phone locked, now I can't play it. Oh, you're no fun. OK, well, that's not going to work because my phone locked, and now it doesn't know about the ready state. That's a problem with WebSock, is if your phone happens to lock, bad things happen. Oh, well. We tried. We failed. We endeavor. We move on. So welcome to the Action Cable Symphony. So who am I that's up in front of you in a Beethoven-looking wig and a tuxedo? Well, first of all, it sounded fun, so I did it. <laughs> Second of all, I used to be an artist and a musician, and I ended up becoming a programmer through a series of very unfortunate accidents. It started all with someone saying, you should try web development. Web development is a lot of fun. It's going to be great. OK, so I get in some HTML and some CSS. It's working decently. OK. And then they said, you should add some JavaScript there. OK, I'm enjoying this. This is really quite entertaining. And then someone said the horrific words I should have said no to, which were, how about a back end? And that's how I became a developer, an operations person, and several other things. And currently, I'm doing that over here at Square, where I'm in charge of Ruby architecture across the company and setting standards, defining things, and a lot of things I'm still learning about, quite honestly. But that's enough about that. Shall we get started then? So what exactly was that that you just witnessed? It was a symphony played with an entire audience of my computer. <laughs> OK, I tried. You'll have to forgive me for that. I'll show you all later. I promise it works. And it's using Rails and Action Cable and various clutches and hackery to make it work, but it does work. More specifically, we were doing Beethoven's Six, the pastoral suite. It's a cheery little tune. I kind of enjoy it. What about the rest of you? So the fun thing is, this song's actual name is Awakening of Cheerful Feelings on Arrival in the Countryside. And I thought that was a really beautiful thing. And that's what we're going to do today. Awaken some cheerful feelings in this brand new world of web sockets, of client latency, which we got to see right there, and various other things. So the more pertinent question here is how? How in the world is something like this? And as it turns out, creating a symphony on smartphones is a really, really hard task. So let's start with a bit of an overview. So what exactly are we going to be covering here today? Well, we're going to start by looking at what does it take on the server to make something like this work? How do you actually get clients to mostly behave themselves preferably? And how do we secure this thing, which is definitely an interesting task? Latency, my personal favorite, as we've just seen and a finale to finish it up. So now for the first major component, we're going to look at the Rails server. And we know it's using Action Cable, but how does that work to make music? I mean, Action Cable is just for chat applications, right? Well, what we start with is this thing called a MIDI file. And for those not familiar, a MIDI file is kind of an old school input output file format that allows us to play music with a bunch of voices, tone fonts, and everything else, which I'm not going to force you to download on your phones because those things are like megabytes in size now. And what we do is we convert this to JSON into something we can actually parse because binary files are not very friendly to the front end. So we try and work with something else here. And this gives us the ability to get the tracks from the MIDI and treat them as their own separate entity. Problem being, there's a lot more complexity there like time signatures, control changes, voices, and other things that are very conveniently not a problem in either Beethoven's Six nor Beethoven's Ninth Symphonies. I wonder how that happened. So overall, it would look a little bit something like this. A flow of data from the conductor all the way down to the individual lemurs that happen to be playing. Now, how does that work? Well, if we take a look at our conductor here, it brings us to our first interesting part of Action Cable, which is there's no real hard requirement on only using one cable. We start with conductor cable, which allow us to have an administrative interface for sending and receiving high-level commands like stop, play, go, buffer music, didn't work, 
Just like a symphony conductor, our conductor channel is in charge of the entire show. So what we do is we break those MIDIs into separate tracks, and we make a channel for each one of the instruments. That way, you can listen to only the part that makes sense for you. So in this case, we might have a channel for French horns, for violas, for violins, and each note in the track, as we broadcast it over the channel, that's going to go to the associated MIDI channel and eventually to the instrument on your phone. Now, our clients only listen for the parts they need, so you don't get the entire symphony, you just get that one part. But then we have our last piece, the players themselves. And when you see you're collecting, uh, connecting, you don't know how many instruments you're going to get. It looks like right now about 46 to 100. There could be any number of them, I mean, 10, 100, or have mercy on my Heroku bill, please, about 1,000, say. And each of these players is a distinct person, so we can keep communications directly back and forth to the client. But let's take a look at those players. Whenever you first connect, you're not sure who you are yet, because you don't know what song you're playing. You don't know what's loading. And that's the job of the conductor, to tell people what instruments you should be playing, and to assign players to each one of those instruments. But they can only do that once they know, again, what song we're actually playing. The assignment uses a super advanced Ruby algorithm to determine the ideal placement for each one of the players that took weeks and weeks and weeks to perfect and honestly is my proudest piece of coding I've ever done in my career. <laughs> very delicately calibrated, but that brings us a very good point of good enough. So anyways, once that command processes, we now have instruments on phones, which some of you have seen from all the lemurs that started popping up on your phones. Now, once we know the instrument of the track, the players can start collecting a buffer of information of notes from the relevant MIDI channels before they have to start playing, so we can offset that a little bit. I guess the problem is this didn't exactly work very cleanly here, but we'll figure it out. So our conductor can send them commands like play or potentially stop. But the nice thing is these clients can send back meta information like what you saw on the dashboard over there. And we probably don't want to start a song until every one of the lemurs is ready to go. So if we take a look back at that dashboard over there, we have the various parts and assignments saying that there are roughly, say, 70 of you connected, 150 of you that have assignments, and 105 of you that are ready, some latency information, and what instruments exactly are out there. I believe roughly 10 of each or something like that. But a lot of this information, you can keep track of what exactly are my clients doing here. Now, that all isn't to say we're not still using REST here. There are some endpoints which may make a lot more sense to use for REST than others. Things like, what are my available songs? How do I log in? And other endpoints which run much the same. The thing about WebSockets is they don't replace RESTful endpoints. They just augment them. They give you an ability to do something more on top of it. So that raises a very good question, which is, does it scale? And I prepared an extra special little demonstration just for that. So we'll go ahead and do this. OK, we'll refresh that then. Come on, you. OK, well, everything has now decided that's one work today. It's supposed to be a very funny joke of it actually playing a musical scale because I have horrible humor. But yes, very funny, very funny. But in all honesty, there are legitimate concerns about scalability and how this scales over a certain number of clients. And there's a lot of research being done on this, especially with some of the folks sitting here in this audience in any cable working on that. And I'd probably not be a great source of information to ask on this at the moment, as this talk is mostly me telling Heroku to make my problems go away with auto scaling. So that's glossing over the top of a lot of information here. 
with some of them saved until later, like security and latency, which are their entire on own fun little sections. So next up, we have our clients, or everything that's going on on your phones. Now, originally, I'd started with jQuery and prototyping a lot of this behavior and managed to get a working proof of concept. The problem was, by this point, I basically implemented kind of a patch hacky version of React by making component-like entities in jQuery. Being as I'm not nearly as clever as Dan Abramov in JavaScript, I decided it was probably a good idea to go ahead and bite the bullet and actually learn React. So a lot of the front end here is learned in, eh, written in React, which I learned in the process of writing this talk, which, by the way, I would not suggest. So the difference here was that there are a lot of DOM manipulations, which is basically the web page itself and all the objects on the web page. And a lot of the actions here are based on the result of listening to web sockets and doing things as a reaction of those things that come in. So since this wasn't really a RESTful application like Angular or Ember was, it didn't quite make sense to do that. And I kind of wanted to learn React anyway, so it served as a very convenient excuse to do that. The first step, as you've seen, is connecting your phone to the interface. And then after that, you get instruments assigned, and a friendly little lemur wanders in to help you play music. But most of the actions taken are directly from listening to the composer, a uh, conductor. The clients are listening for messages on the player channel that originates from commands sent to the conductor from the administrator, which would be me on this case, and things like assignment, playing music, and even keeping clocks in sync which is all well and good, but how in the world is that thing actually playing music? Well, it's using this magical little tool called Tone.js and synthesizers. So what happens is it listens to an instrumental track and it can get a series of notes that it wants to play. Now, some of these notes are artificially modified on phones because I found out the hard way Phones don't have a bass register. They can't play cello or bass or anything else. So there was one time I was demoing this and all of a sudden the entire bottom section just fell out from under it. And I was sitting there trying to figure it out until I'm like, wait a second, can phones even play that low? We plugged headphones into one of the phones and sure enough, it's playing just like normal. So phone speakers cannot handle bass music. A good thing to know if you ever want to try something like this. But the nice thing about Tone.js is it has a feature to keep a timeline of all the notes and events that happen on this actual sequence. Problem is, it's only good at keeping time locally. You see, they never thought that it'd be a good idea to scale this across multiple distributed phones. And they were very wary whenever I asked them, hey, how's it possible to do this? They're like, are you sure? <laughs> kind of, I don't know. I'm hoping it works. But that's for another section of the talk. So what we do artificially here is we add an offset to whatever that time is that it's supposed to start at. But we'll get to that more in latency. Now, of course, this doesn't even scratch the surface of what's possible with Tone.js, which can be used for substantially more if you set your mind to it. I'll have some resources later for people wanting to learn a little bit more on that front. But that brings us to our next issue, is what happens if a particularly mischievous lemur decides that they want to interfere with that connection or do bad things to it? So security is always an issue, and even with WebSockets, it's still very much present. In the case of this administrative dashboard here, we're using device. And it would be rather bad if someone else could start playing music and orchestral things without the proper authority to do so. Though I'm not really using typical sessions here, we're using something else entirely, which works a little bit better with things like front ends. And those are called JWTs or JOTs or JSON Web Tokens to take care of sessions. And as with everything in technology, there are pros and cons here. And as like every conference speaker, I'm going to conveniently highlight the pros, gloss over the cons, and pretend that it's not an issue. So JWTs are interesting in that they're self-contained. That means no need to query information on the server. The entire session is encoded in the token. That also means they're stateless in nature. The server doesn't need to keep track of the session. The token already has all those things. Now, if that sounds hideously insecure to you, good. You have a future in information security, and we should talk later. Joking aside, though, that's the last item, which is the fact that tokens happen to be signed, stateless, and self-contained. So taking a look at a token, that looks like a really hot mess worth of text. It's actually base64 encoded. And if we color that a little bit, we'll see that there are actually three distinct sections there all of which have me separated by a dot. Or a little bit more succinctly, A, B, and C there. 
So what these actually are are the header, the payload, and the signature. So a header tells us important information like what algorithm was used to sign this token and what type of token it actually is. The payload, which is where a lot of security concerns come in, are things like who am I, what am I, what should I be allowed to do, and what permissions do I have? So you can basically send over the entirety of what a client should know how to do and hopefully will do as a result of this. But that brings us to the next section, which is the signature, which is basically taking a cryptographic hash of both the header and the payload there and appending a secret, which is why it's actually secure, is because on the back end, you're the one signing it. So hopefully you don't have your Rails application secret leaked, otherwise you have bigger issues to worry about. So these three things are the entirety of what a user should really need to run an application like this. But that still raises a good question. What if said mischievous lemur decides we're going to tamper with this and have a little bit of fun? Like, let's say, for instance, we have the classical example that was used for strong parameters. This mischievous little lemur decides, I want to be an administrator, so I'm going to append my token and tell it that I'm an administrator, re-encrypt it, and send it back to the server. And then I'm going to have God permissions to do whatever in the world I want to do. Well, remember, there is that signature there as last bit, which means as soon as that gets to the server, that's going to get detected real quick. So if we take a look at our tampered token again, and we take a look at the original checksum, those two don't match. So we know that token's been modified, and we know that we need to revoke it, which does bring us to one of the issues of JWT. Because it's stateless, if you happen to revoke a token or something else like that, you have to introduce state to actually stop people from logging in, which means the majority of the nice features you get kind of get circumvented there. Or basically, we're saying, you shall not authenticate. No, I just totally wanted to draw that slide, so I did. But as with everything, there are always holes. For JWT, it was denying tokens for malicious actors. You'd still retain some of that on the server and have a deny list. But if that deny list goes down, it's open season. You're going to have a very bad day. Now, there's really no such thing as silver, develop, uh, silver bullet in development, and there are always trade-offs to be made. And being honest about those trade-offs will save you a lot of frustration later on. But the nice thing of that, that being stateless is that you don't have to verify sessions all the time. You just have to check a cryptographic token as to whether or not that's there, which I've had issues in the past in operations of OAuth and all these things where it brought down entire services. And because that's a single point of failure, bye-bye. You're not logging into PlayStation. Now, that brings me to perhaps the most annoying, but certainly one of the most fascinating parts about this talk, which is latency. So as it turns out, getting everything to play on time is actually a really hard problem to solve, as we saw a little bit earlier. Networks are, by their very nature, inconsistent, and clocks even more so. Every additional step that we add gives another hop, which means more time that that thing is going to take. So each of our phones has a very distinct time, and one would think that these things are consistent, or at very least, mostly consistent. For the most part, for everyday use, they are. Chances are you're not going to have a lot of trouble with an approximate 100 millisecond off if you glance at your clock. You're not going to be late for a meeting. You're not going to be late for a job. You're not going to be late for much of anything if you have that type of resolution. So there's a lot we can accept there as being pretty much good enough. So for music, if it were a second off, you'd hear it quite loudly, and it'd be very unsettling. So how is it we take all these disparate phones and give them an idea of what a consistent time is? This was actually one of the questions which worried me whenever I proposed this talk in the first place, and it's a very hard problem to contend with. If we were to play the same note against each of those clocks that we saw originally there, we'd end up with something sounding like three phones at slightly distinct intervals, and a sound that sounds a lot more like a splatter than an actual solid note. So time is complicated. It's this wibbly wobbly timey wimey mess that takes a lot of sorting and things to be consistent. It requires a single source of truth as to what time it is, something we can trust to be a good source, which is why I was very happy whenever I found out that someone had already done this hard work for me in this thing called timesync.js. It has options for peer-to-peer -peer and server syncing. In our case, we're using server for now. It takes care of things like time to the server, round trip time, deviation, and is even nice enough to give us a callback whenever that offset happens to change, which is why your phones were all saying things like, 
I'm 20 milliseconds off the server. I'm negative 800,000 milliseconds off the server. I'm whatever amount of time off the server. So we add a timestamp endpoint to our Rails server. It only responds to post because this expects RPC, so we had to patch it a little bit and some hacks. But basically what it's doing is it's saying, Rails server, what exactly is the time? And the Rails server sends back a stamp. And what that does is it runs computations on this on an average of, say, four timestamps sent back and forth and says, OK, how far off am I of this actual clock? Giving us a lot more consistent interface to work with and an ability to make a clock class that we can use to ask, what's the current time with that offset taken into account? So remembering what our previous splatter was, we have notes that are overlapping, sure, but contain some inconsistencies. Once we use time sync, we can offset that and get at least a fairly decent approximation of what the current time is. It won't be exact, but I'm sure that it's close enough that it'll sound like a mostly cohesive orchestra. Now, there are always ways we could make this more exact, but that requires atomic clocks and a lot of research on things like the Google Spanner paper. So in the end, we get phones that are in sync, but that brings up a good question about the servers themselves, which is if we happen to have load balancing, if we happen to have auto scaling, if we happen to have all these things, all those servers are going to have different timestamps, aren't they? That turns out to have a really interesting thing called NTP, which takes care of this on the back end. In the case of most server providers like Heroku, AWS, and everyone else, they're running this in GMT to ensure that clocks are kept mostly consistent, which is really an underappreciated offering. I mean, can you imagine what type of chaos there would be if clocks ended up out of sync? Perhaps a bidding site has a lot of offers on two different items within a fraction of a second, but one server happens to be just a couple seconds ahead, causing that item to actually go to the person who's slur, but because the server's faster, they got the item it would be chaos, and that brings us to a very good question about real-time software. What exactly is real-time? And no, I don't mean like human versions of lemurs, but real-time out in the real world. So in movies, we noticed that in the last decade, there was a movement from 30 frames per second, which is about 33 milliseconds a frame, to about 60 frames per second, which was about 16 milliseconds a frame, which I know I found very unsettling whenever that happened. I was trying to figure out what in the world was wrong with movies add on to the top of that 3D, and it was a very nauseating experience. We can certainly detect this difference now, but as it turns out, our minds are very good at filling in those gaps. If you took the reverse, you'd notice the drop very clearly, but until you knew 60 frames per second was a standard, you probably wouldn't know the difference there. In games, it's all about chasing down lag time to get more precise experiences. Ideally, we want under 10 milliseconds, but 20 seconds probably won't get anything bad happening. Sometimes those few milliseconds, though, make a big difference between winning and losing games, so a lot of gamers are very understandably annoyed with this. It requires a very precise server to sort this all out and make sure everyone and everything on the screen is at least some approximation of real time. The more, the better. In sports, real-time reactions are actually a lot slower, but these are for top sprinters in the world, and they're still between about 150 and 200 milliseconds. And to us, that seems instantaneous. For anyone who happens to be on the receiving end of trying to race against one of those people, not very fun. But by the time they register a starting signal going off, it takes a fraction of a second at least to register that means go. For a symphony orchestra, well, you'd think that it would be a lot closer to exact time. But as it turns out, and perhaps kind of amusingly, it's really not. The inconsistency is, by its very nature, what gives orchestras the sound that they have. It gives it this nice little timbre, a color, a feel. That's why a live orchestra sounds the way it does, and a MIDI sounds very robotic and exact. Those little inconsistencies in time turn into the character of the song of the orchestra almost like a signature, which is why every orchestra sounds a little bit different and why you get a lot of different feelings from each variant of a single song. So why exactly would a conductor be waving around a giant white stick then up on stage. It doesn't make much sense. Well, it turns out that people are a lot faster to reacting to visual stimulus. And if you happen to be in the audience with a cell phone playing an orchestra, you're probably not going to be able to hear all the other people around you. The same with an orchestra is you can only tell by looking at a central source to say, this is what time it is, this is what beat it is. And that's how they know when to play on time, because otherwise it's a cacophony of a mess. And I know from playing in orchestras before, you have no idea what's going on. And you hope it sounds good to the audience. Oh, don't worry, it does most of the time. Humans aren't great at being exactly on time for anything, and oftentimes they really don't need to be because real time probably isn't necessary. 
which brings up a very good point. I mean, when Action Cable was first being considered, DHH had said, and rightfully so, that he could make a polling application for a chat application to register, what was it, every two to three seconds, and the person on the other end would have absolutely no idea that it wasn't happening instantaneously. I mean, this is masked by those little things like X person is typing or those little dot, dot, dots that show up in various areas. But the point is, you really don't need a strict resolution window for real time in this case. And you probably only need good enough because each level of precision you gain, it ends up being diminishing returns. Granted, I could stand to be a little bit more precise on this implementation here, but it does the job. Now, I did intend to do a finale here, which was Beethoven's Ninth, but unfortunately, it seems like the music is not quite working, so I'm going to have to do this later for whoever would like to hear it. And I do apologize, I will try and see if I can get that working later. But the reason that I chose that song is because of joy. And because honestly, Ruby brings a lot of us joy, which is why we're here today, which is why we've had all the experiences we've had. And to me, that's a very beautiful thing that I can stand up here on stage in a tuxedo, with a wig, with baton, with coconut shells, with Lord knows whatever else I have in this bag up here, and conduct a symphony orchestra on cell phones because we enjoy that. We get joy out of that. We enjoy whimsy and beauty and all of these things, which is what really drives me to Ruby. So to wrap up, if you want to find out more about the lemurs and everywhere they are, everywhere they're going next, feel free to follow me on any one of the social network sites, Twitter being the one that's inconsistent. There is a very fun story behind that, which you can ask me later on. But let's just say I'm not getting BA Weaver on Twitter. And yes, people still do use IRC. I've actually gotten job offers from IRC. It's really nice. And of course, one of the new Mastodon instances, ruby.social. Now, some of you might have noticed that at RubyCop, I played a little game with stickers of orchestral lemurs. And those stickers are back. Tomorrow, we're going to start having various square engineers running around with stickers or stickers hiding all over the place. If you want to find out where they're hiding, take a look at Lemur's RailsConf, and I'll try to post pictures of who exactly has which lemur. It's your job to find them, though, and good luck, because some of them are really introverted, which makes it very interesting. <laughs> now, if for some reason you do manage to find all the lemurs, there is a special prize at the Square booth. And there's a raffle associated with this. So yes, we actually do have fun things associated with this. But I figured it's a lot more fun collecting stickers, because I like stickers. And I think a lot of you do, too. Do you like stickers? Yeah. People like stickers. So <laughs> as far as credits, this type of talk doesn't happen without a lot of people really helping me out. Some of them are sitting here in this room, people who've worked on Action Cable before, people who worked on Any Cable, people who listen to feedback, people who listen to me say, hey, I want to play a symphony orchestra up on stage, and saying, that sounds awesome. Instead, that's completely crazy. What are you on? Nothing, nothing. But it brings a very good point, which is the beauty of the Ruby community is that we get in on stuff together. We build together. We work together. We learn together. And that's the beautiful thing is that I can reach out and ask any number of people for help on these things, asking questions, get feedback. And you could do that, too, just by reaching out to the person next to you, introducing yourself, saying hi. I mean, who knows? It may be someone you end up spending years later down the road with or even working together. And that's the beauty of these conferences is you can meet so many different people. And that's another part of the joy of Ruby. But I've been prattling on for long enough now, so we'll go ahead and call it good. Thank you for your time.